What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers. DJ Buck back with you as we have a uh, intriguing Thursday night game, which we talked about the other day, Buck. But we have a uh, uh, a slate of games here. And it feels like I don't want to say these must win, you know, cliches that you get thrown out there, but there's some desperate teams out there. Uh, a big weekend of football upcoming. Big weekend of football, and even though we're only concluding the first quarter of the season. There's some big games. Every team has these milestone moments where you want to evaluate yourself against other teams just to kind of see where you're at in the process. But then you have some of these teams that have gotten off to slow starts who just want to get in the win column, who just want to get in the win column to give themselves a chance to have a respectable first quarter record. So um, it's early, so it's not the game of the century, but it's the biggest game that we have this week, so let's talk about it. Yeah, we're going to talk about three teams in particular today in three scenarios. We're going to talk about one team who's doing things better than everybody else. Uh, That would be the Philadelphia Eagles, an undefeated squad. We're going to look at a team that is better than they were last year in the Atlanta Falcons, particularly in their run game and and why that is. And then we're going to look at a team that even though their record is good, they need to be better. And, And that's the Denver Broncos and Russell Wilson. And what's you know, what's wrong with that offense? We'll do a little deep dive on that. But I, I say we start off here with the Eagles. Um, Buck, I think this is a legitimate Super Bowl team. Uh, when you look at how they're mm-hmm. constructed and how they're playing the development of Jalen Hurts, we broke down Jalen Hurts a few episodes ago. But outside of the quarterback, uh, what would you attribute this early success to for the Eagles? <clears throat> the offensive and defensive lines. We've yeah. talked about it for years. You work for an organization. You work for that organization and understand that their philosophy is to build from within, meaning build from inside out. They've committed capital to making sure that their offensive line and defensive lines are loaded with big time playmakers. And you see it. And because they're able to control the point of attack, it gives them a chance to put those little skill players that do all the the work on the outside and get all the accolades. It gives them an opportunity. But the guys who are doing the heavy lifting are the ones inside and this year compared to previous years man they are loaded uh just the ability to run people in and out the game on the defensive line a deep talented rotation allows those guys to beat you up they wear you down over time and they are fresher than you are in the late stages of the game and the same could be said about their offensive line they're so talented that they can absorb an injury and it doesn't impact the way that the rest of the, the, the unit of five plays I want to talk about the offensive line first. Um, Jeff Stoutland, start with the offensive line coach. One of the Mm -hmm. best, if not the best in the league right now. He has got an unbelievable reputation, came from Alabama. He's been with the Eagles for quite some time uh, and does a nice job of developing linemen. So you look at it, there's no better example than Jordan Mailata. Came in as raw as a $2 steak. I mean, he, he had really no football background, and here he's developed him into uh, you know one of the better left tackles in the NFL. He's a massive human being, but to see that kind of uh, that jar of clay that he just molded into a, a pretty elite left tackle is a is a great example of the coach that you have there in Stout. And then I also add, Buck, when you look at their starting lineup, Jordan Mailata, homegrown. Landon Dickerson, homegrown. Kelsey, homegrown. Samalo, homegrown. Lane Johnson, homegrown. Their best backup, their second round pick from last year, Cam Jurgen. So we both, I think, would agree uh, we see as a future Pro Bowl player. He was a draft pick. Uh, Jack Driscoll, another one of their backups, draft pick. These guys are all homegrown. So where other teams, you can roll the dice on free agency, go out, and you know sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. They know all these guys. They've had them their entire careers. Had their entire careers. And one of the benefits of drafting and developing your own is that you know their character, you know what they're about, you've seen them in the building, you know how they work. And even if they have some deficiencies, you've had an opportunity to work around those deficiencies so they could have success. So to me, it has always been a sensible decision to invest in your own team. But what they've also done is, Howie Roseman and staff have done a really good job of acquiring talent via means of trade and free agency. But they used the vehicle as it was intended for. It is not necessarily to build your entire team, but it's to fill glaring holes in your roster. They go and make a move for A.J. Brown. They had a number one receiver in Devontae Smith, but they wanted another one because we've seen the increased popularity of having two receivers that can act as a number one. It benefits your offense because now teams don't know where the double team. So A.J. Brown being a guy that they traded for. 
You think about years ago when they went and got Darius Slay because they wanted a number one corner. He is playing like a number one corner. They got him in free agency to make it happen. So these are the things that you have to be able to do to make sure that you get the kind of players that you need to get your team over the top. Yeah, you know, again, I just I look at that defensive side of the ball. You talk about the defensive line a minute ago. You look at the number of guys they can throw at you. Um, it is a deep, deep group, uh, talented players. You look at what they've done um, in the secondary, Bradbury to go along with, with Darius Slay, who you just mentioned, uh, Avante Maddox, homegrown. They got uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson on the cheap with a trade. It feels like Howie never loses a trade. Whenever he makes a trade, for the most part, he's got to have as high a batting average as anybody because it feels like he's never having to pay top dollar or premium prices for some premium players. So it's uh, it's it's drafting. It's being uh, – selective in terms of the guys you're going to go out and acquire the veterans you know getting premier guys they've gotten some big time talent guys that also have you know work ethic competitiveness character mm -hmm. um, they've checked all those boxes so it's really been interesting to see um, how this whole thing has come together but i think they're in a situation where not only they have some frontline guys you look at the depth throughout um, I mean, even at the quarterback position, like Gardner Minshew has got to be one of the better backups uh, in the league, just in terms of what he could do to win you three or four games if you needed him to get out there, if, if Hurts were to get nicked up. They've got depth. They've got depth on both sides of the ball. This is a deep, deep team, um, and the injuries are coming. We've seen it come for a bunch of teams already. They're going to come. They're going to happen. I think this Eagles team's equipped to handle it. They are equipped to handle it. Um, <clears throat> and when you just look at how they've been able to do it, each of those guys that we mentioned were traded. I misspoke when I talked about Darius Day because he was traded and so, then he signed this big deal yeah. with the Eagles. But you traded for him. You traded for A.J. Brown. Garner Minshew was acquired in a trade. They have a clear understanding of what they want from a player, how much they value the player, and what they're willing to give up to bring said player into the program. It has worked for them. But because they've done such a good job of drafting, developing, and re-signing their own, it has given them the opportunity to have what we call some luxury items added to the roster. And those luxury items have been paying off handsomely of late. Yeah, and I think the other thing I'll add uh, as we kind of wrap up our Eagles chat here, um, we, we've mentioned this before about navigating 17 games in the postseason. You're going to have to win different types of games. There's going to be You're going to find yourself in some messy street fights. You're going to find yourself in a shootout. I think that they can scrap and find themselves in kind of that physical, muddy, you know, nasty type yep. of a game because of the line of scrimmage play that they have and then if they get in a shootout you know you go out and you get aj brown you have Devonte smith you got dallas goddard i think you know with hurts playing the way he's playing right now i think you've got a shot you know to compete in the shootout as well yeah you can win a couple of different ways and what i like about the way the team is comprised is they have the ability to play physical football by running the ball and doing those things that are necessary when you get to the postseason but it hasn't prevented them from challenging jalen hurts and their offense to be efficient as a passing unit. This aerial attack is terrific, it's explosive. They have a lot of intriguing weapons. And so I was worried in the off season, like, hey man, is this hype real? Are they really going to be a team that we talk about? I mean, early in the year, they have exceeded expectations as one of the top teams in football. Yeah, again, really early, but I, I like the way this team's built and I like their chances going forward. Um, all right, we're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about this Atlanta Falcons run game. Uh, which is one of the most improved units uh, in the NFL uh, from last year to this year. What are they doing? Is it just Cordero Patterson? Is there something scheme-wise? We're going to jump into that right after this. All right, last year, the Atlanta Falcons rushing attack, second worst in the NFL, only 1,451 yards. Right now, uh, through three games, 470 yards rushing, they're fifth in the NFL uh, I give Arthur Smith a lot of credit for this, Buck. I like the uh, the pieces that they have in their run game. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on why you think this is working so well, and then uh, I'll follow you up on what I've seen. Well, I'm going to talk about the ageless wonder, Cordero Patterson, who at 30-plus years of age has decided that he wanted to be a premier running back in the National Football League. Hats off to Patterson. Hats off to Arthur Smith for having the vision and the creativity to be able to get it done. When you go back and you think about Kadero Patterson and when he was coming out of Tennessee, remember DJ, it was really hard to figure out what position to put him at. He was a guy who played wide receiver. He was a terrific returner, kick and punt returner. Did a bunch of different things for the volunteers on 
sweeps, reverses, ends around. You just didn't know what he was going to do. Then he goes to Minnesota, becomes a Pro Bowl kick returner. Immediately, Norv Turner flirts with him at running back, but didn't commit to it. Goes to New England, similar stuff. No one necessarily commits to him being a running back. Same thing in Chicago. But for whatever reason, at 30 years of age, he goes to Atlanta last year. They get in a pinch. They need a running back. He steps up. And now he's this supersized wide receiver lining up in the backfield in the I formation coming down hill. And so we can talk about the tactics, but I'm going to tell you, it's the tenacity and the toughness that this guy, a former all-pro kick returner, has added to this offense as a downhill running back that has given this team a different identity. You just don't see it. You just don't see a wide receiver running downhill like a running back. I'll tell you what, if I was with a team right now um, and I had a wide out who was not one of my top three guys and he was over 200 pounds, at least in practice, I, I want to see what it looks like. Hey, you know, you haven't really established yourself as a wide receiver in this league. Let's let's give you some reps at running back. See what you look like. See if you might find something. You know, I, I and I'm just throwing out a name like like if you're a Jalen Rager. Okay? The Biscuit should not talk. The Biscuit should not. Yeah, yeah just perfect example. Jalen Rager. Just, yeah, full-time running back. We're going to make you a full-time running back. We'll see how it goes. This will be an experiment. We'll try it out. I mean, there's a lot of receivers are 210 to 220 pounds that haven't really hit, uh, you know, that haven't found their mark. Why not, man? Why not? In a time where you're, you know, nobody wants to play the running back position anymore in youth football and in college because of the, because of the limits, it might be hard to motivate somebody on the front end. It's a lot easier to motivate them on the back end and be like, Hey, here's the exit. Here's the end of your career. <laughs> potentially you not having a job. Or there's the running back option. Also, yes, running back looks a little more palatable. I'd be very interested in that in that op- uh, opportunity. Yeah, I, I think, and, and this is unprecedented. We saw Ty Montgomery have some success uh, kind of making the transition as the empty back for the Green Bay Packers. We saw He's Debo to bounce go off around. last year. Yeah, Debo going off. And, and DJ, I think you have to have the, the right mindset to be able to do it because it's a tough guy position. Playing running back is a tough guy position. Running between the tackles, getting hit every time. 30 to 40 car wrecks a game that you're involved in when you're running on those inside plays. Yeah, it's tough, and it's not for everybody. However, Kadero Patterson, what he has been able to do, what he's been able to show, DJ, he's like a top five runner right now, like just in terms of the way that he's getting it done. You're not supposed to be able to do this in your 30s. I don't care what anyone says. You're not supposed to be able to just throw someone in the backfield and say, hey, by the way, you're the 30-year-old running back when everyone's trying to get rid of the running back. Um, So, yeah, there are definitely some traits that are needed to be able to pull off this kind of transition. But after watching him do it, you know it's a copycat league. Everybody and their mom is trying to find the one guy on their roster that they can make that tweener player, that running back wide receiver that is able to get it done. But Antonio Gibson in Washington, he was a guy in college who did it. So there's a way for this – uh, transition to take place and take take place more often. You just got to dig and di- dig down deep into people's backgrounds and see who has a little running back ability. Who can I put at running back? You know, there's like names that are just kind of popping up. Maybe guys that didn't that didn't hit at the, at, to live up to where they were picked. Right. Let me just give you a couple mm-hmm. here. And and maybe that maybe there's a zero percent chance this would work. But shoot, I would have been at least try it. Kevin White. How about Kevin White yeah, with his size big. and speed? Might give him a shot. I know uh, Bashad Perriman's been a little bit up and down in his career. Big, strong, fast. Um, think about him having potentially an opportunity to play that role. I mean, I you know you got to go through some guys. I know Treadwell's had some injuries, but a guy who was picked high was a big mm-hmm. guy who didn't really live up to where he was picked. Um, shoot, watching Kenny Galladay try and catch the ball the other day, it might be his last stop. Uh, maybe he had uh, <laughs> something like we're gonna that. We're going to hand it to him. We can't yeah, throw it to I mean, him, so we're going to hand it to him. No, yeah, I know. And look, Corey Davis, Corey Davis has been a good player. He got paid, you know, coming off a big year with the Titans and with the Jets. He's been a solid player there, but that's a big – that's a running back type frame for somebody you like know, that. It's just be curious to try out some of these dudes in some of, in some of these spots. Well, I think, I, think, I think now the fascination is you want to find a way to be creative with your running game. And so we saw years ago with the Rams and Robert Woods and uh, Cooper Cup fly sweeps, jet sweeps, being able yeah. to utilize those guys, take advantage of their speed and quickness to be able to do it. Uh, Cordero Patterson, the little bit of difference is what I would say some of the prerequisite would be if I'm going to make a transition like that, I need someone who maybe has return skills, someone who also has competed in special teams. 
I need some of the ego out of the mix so I can get you to really hone in on being a running back, meaning you're going to have to sit in there and deal with some pass protection problems, meaning you're going to have to go facing the fan when the linebacker comes scot-free and you got to be able to do it. Guys who've played special teams, they kind of know what that is like. But if you've been pretty all your life and outside dancing <laughs> around with your, your spats and stuff, a little, little different job description, a little harder, nope. a little harder to make that transition. But I certainly would explore being able to put some of those guys in the backfield because it gives you a different weapon on offense. Yeah, I mean, even some of the smaller, quicker guys. I look at the, the charges with a guy like DeAndre Carter, who's a kick returner, who's explosive hey man, that dude and dynamic. Scared to death. Like last week watching, I kept waiting. Yeah. Hey, man, yeah, keep an eye on him. This guy, he can get loose because you saw it in the preseason. You've seen some of the yeah. things. He, he has some talent, some juice. But, yeah, that's another one. DJ, I think with so many teams going spread, empty formation, being able to have that fifth wide receiver that can get in the backfield and do some of that stuff, that's when it becomes problematic. Because remember, with the Packers, not only was it Ty Montgomery, Randall Cobb could go in the backfield. Yeah. It's, we've talked about positionless football, being able to have some of those guys that can do some of those responsibilities. You ain't going to be a full-time running back, but being able yeah, to do some of them is added value to that. So let me give you what I saw just watching this team in particular. Um why I thought they've having success. Not only is just Cordell Patterson's an incredible talent, but scheme wise and some of the things they're doing, I watched all the explosive runs. There is a lot of things in common with these explosive runs. You're going to see a lot of speed motion at the snap. So you're getting a lot of eyeballs, eye candy, whatever you want to call that, but you're getting a lot of speed motion to, to kind of grab some eyes and create some hesitancy there at the second level. You've got the threat of the quarterback uh, coming out the back door, which is holding the backside end. That's the advantage of having somebody like Marcus Mariota. You have to account for him. Um, and then I'll be honest with you, maybe the biggest surprise to me, uh, Buck, was the fact that you look at these explosive runs, Kyle Pitts is involved in a lot of them and doing a, a mm -hmm. more than adequate job as a blocker. So, you know, we were complaining he wasn't getting the, the targets and the touches that he needs uh, in the first two games. That changed last week. Um, but, man, I give him credit. Not, not getting the ball, not getting the rock. Didn't look like he was a guy who was pouting. He's actually done a pretty nice job in the run game. So, uh, you have those factors, and then you know Mariota has three. I think he had three explosive runs, mm -hmm. two of them off of scrambles where it's it's a pass. He's there's nothing there. He takes off and makes something happen. But I've always it, we and we've I feel like again we beat this uh, beat this drum all the time. I'm always frustrated when you watch static teams who just line up and there's no motion and they just line up and go. Mm -hmm. To me, like every run play, if you have to worry about some type of speed motion or you don't know if he's going to get the ball, is it going to be a misdirection play? And then I've got to account for the quarterback. Like those two things, those are those are easy ways that almost every team in the league can help their rushing attack. And, and a lot of teams don't do it. It baffles me. No, a lot of teams don't do it. You think about what Cal Shanahan has done for years in the 49ers offense. It's always some kind of motion before every play. You talk about a team that normally does a pre-snap shift of motion 70-plus percent of the time. It is a huge factor because as a defensive player, you already got so many things on your mind. You're trying to hone in on tendencies, and you're trying to say, okay, when the, the back sets on this side, it's high probability of these things. But when you start moving the pieces on the chessboard around, it blurs some of that. So you can't get a jump on what you're anticipating based on your film study. So, yeah, motion shifts, uh, exotic misdirection things that kind of can just divert your eyes just for a nanosecond. It allows yeah. a good running team to be able to find creases and a good running back. Man, he can get to the second level. When he gets to the second level, that's when big things happen. Yeah, they also do a nice job, too. Arthur Smith does a nice job with the fullback. A fullback, I mean, in high school football, Buck, I'm sure you you talk to your guys about it all the time. They usually – not able to find. Yeah, but if that's hard to find, the, the fullback's going to take you to the ball. Is kind of what I'm getting at. If you're playing at the, you're a mm -hmm. linebacker, you're a safety, and you you got your eyes in the backfield. You, the fullback's usually the ball's following the fullback. They will use the fullback in misdirection. You'll see linebackers drift and pull with the with the fullback, and Cordell Patterson just stays front side. And you're like, no, there's nobody there. And I'm like, oh yeah, they, they they're just using the fullback. It's just to pull pull those guys out of there. Yeah, some influence plays like they get. It's a tendency breaker and. There's yep. a lot of creativity when it comes with uh, to being able to do that kind of stuff. I do like that we're talking about the running game because you know how it always starts every year. Every year, everyone is throwing the ball all over the yard. Like we're ringing up yep. these crazy numbers. Quarterbacks are, I mean, just tossing it, hucking it. DJ, you know what comes. Once we get into November, all that slows down. 
we begin to see real football, more guys running the ball, because the only way for you to fully obtain control of the game, you have to be able to run it so you can dictate the terms, not only your offense to their defense, but how their offense now has to play against your defense based on how you've utilized the clock. Yeah, and and to put a bow on the uh, Falcons, those nine, I believe there were nine explosive runs that I watched, seven of them were first and ten runs. So, you know, first down runs, getting yourself going. They're drive starters. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than sitting there. At, you know, I know in analytics you talk about first early down passing is key and it's important, but, man, there's nothing worse than being second and ten. Um, you know, be able to get some explosives. Their drive starters oh, yeah. get you in a rhythm. Yeah, no, it, it, it's hard. Second and ten is like the worst down in football because now you're yeah that's what I'm getting at. yeah 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 I mean yep. it's it it, it 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 so if you have an incomplete on first down you're like oh means I have to throw on second down and try and get half of this back so I can go on third down and then figure out what it is um you know I I just think the movement that we're seeing with these teams and the creativity in the run game and what Arthur Smith was doing also I, when you talked about Cal Pitts it made me think you know Arthur Smith's old position was the tight end coach. You know, he also has an O-line experience. So I am sure that when he pops on the tape, his eyes are always very aware of what Cal Pitts has done. And I'm sure Cal Pitts has heard about what he's done on every play from the head man. <laughs> that tends to motivate players to do it a little differently so they're not caught out in meetings. Yeah, no doubt. Um, all right, we're going to get to Russell Wilson. This team is uh, is 2-1. and one. Uh, miraculously, because the offense has not been very good. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about how to fix this Denver Broncos offense. It's time to show your good side, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers, and I'd like to see the good side of this Denver Broncos offense. We haven't seen it yet, uh, Buck. I mean, I've got some simplistic answers for why they aren't very good, I, I, I will give it to you, though. Is, Let's hear those answers. Complicated? I, I, simple. You want to know uh, simple answers? Yeah, those we'll simple answers. Okay. You're getting sacked too much. So I think they're seventh in mm. sacks allowed. They're second in the league in drop passes. Red zone turnovers. I mean, like, mm. I feel like sometimes it's like we got to dig in and we got to find out what's wrong with Russell Wilson. What's wrong with the Denver Broncos? Is this head coach any good? And I'm like, okay, well, where are the complicated answers? I don't know. They can't. They aren't protecting very well. They're not catching very well, and they're turning the football over. That's pretty, oh, pretty bad formula. You, you know, you know what this sounds like? This sounds like some of the conversations that I've had at Granada Hills Charter, John Elway's <laughs> alma mater. So the first thing that you said is, oh, we're we're getting sacked a lot, and oh, we don't catch well. So you know what the head coach's response normally is? We probably should run the football because every time we pass it. It doesn't appear that there are a lot of good things happening. So maybe we run the football. <laughs> maybe that helps us. And maybe that allows Russell Wilson to throw the ball in favorable situations. When you look at how this team was really constructed prior to Nathaniel Hackett, when Mike Munchak was the O-line coach and they were having success, it was because they could run the ball. The guys that are up front are better going forward than going backwards. The two running backs in the backfield, Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams, as a tandem, they are a problem. When the Broncos have decided to run the ball, they have had a lot of success. So to me, this is the thing where you cannot allow what you paid the quarterback to impact how you go about your business winning games. Russell has gotten his money. Now it's about calling the game to win the game. I believe that once Nathaniel Hackett gets out of the internal pressure of having to justify having a franchise quarterback and showing him off, when they get back to the business of, hey, man, we're doing whatever we need to do to win the game, and if that involves us running the ball 35 times and Russell throwing it 25 to 30, let's do it. It has to be about what helps the team, not necessarily what helps number three. Yeah, I mean, I think that formula, their defense has kind of proven that this is a formula that will, that will work if they keep playing like they've played. I mean, I think that's got kind of lost in the discussion here. Mm -hmm. um, it's just how well they're playing on the other side of the ball. They haven't been very dynamic, and I think people kind of look and say, okay, where the dynamic plays come from? And I think you're kind of, you're kind of hitting it on the head there, Buck. When that run game is, is going, 
um, I think you're going to see more of those vertical pops and more of those vertical opportunities. Um, but the number that's on our screen right now, one touchdown inside the red zone in 2022. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. there you go. It, your point totals look a lot different. A lot different. You had six more touchdowns to their ledger. They have to be able to do that. And everyone thinks because, look, I've been pegged a Russell hater. It's not a Russell hater. It's an evaluation of like what Russell really is. Great player. But as we've talked about it, sometimes we've done TV segments on Path to the Draft about, oh, this is the toy that you get for Christmas. Here are the instructions. Where if I look at when Russell has played his best throughout his career, it has been about the running game setting the table for him to be able to do his magic stuff either off play action down the field or on bootlegs and scrambles. But now because Russell is older and because he's a reluctant runner, as opposed to the eager runner that he used to be, it's more important now than ever. Make this a run play action team as opposed to a straight drop back team. Because the running game sets the table, it brings somebody in the box, creates big opportunities down the field. And as he gets older, Less is more. Less Russell ends up being more Russell down the line because now you're not using them for every play. You use them for a handful of plays that helps your offense get over the top. Yeah, I think you you made an interesting point there uh, about the lack of scrambling, right? And the younger Russell. What did the younger Russell look like? Let me give you a couple players here. Jalen Hurts, we talked about earlier. Jalen Hurts mm -hmm. has 18 scrambles this year. And that's where when you're young and you've got your legs, there's an opportunity for you to make big plays off of those scrambles. That's the most in the league. Uh, you look at Josh Allen, he's got 11. And how many times have we seen Josh Allen extend and create and make magical mm -hmm. plays? So far this season, uh, Russell Wilson's got six. So you look at Jalen Hurts is three times as many in terms of yeah. extending, creating, making things happen. So I think – kind of the well we're just gonna we're gonna call a zillion passing plays and russ is gonna be able to scramble around make some magic happen in a good number of those it's just not that's not happening that's not who he is anymore no that's not who he is the other thing and i don't know if you had a chance to hear nathaniel hackett's presser he talked about he didn't call him out directly but he talked about we just kind of need to exhaust the plays a little more before we kind of <laughs> play a little stand lot and so you and i had a discussion I've never believed that Russell is a timing and rhythm passer, meaning that is catch, turn, throw. That has not necessarily been his game. In Seattle, his game was fake, deep drop, shot, or mm -hmm. fake, deep drop, ah, I don't like it, run around, yeah. scramble, or make a play down the field. When you get older and you're asking Russell to play like Drew Brees and Tom Brady and those guys, They've always played like that. So to mm -hmm. think that he is going to become a timing and rhythm passer later in his career, man, it, it's, it's fool's gold. That's not who he is. And so to help him more play action, more stuff where you're able to utilize the threat of the run game to separate the defense and give him more opportunities. And so when the Broncos get to that point, then we'll see Russell play at a high level. But if they're going to keep trying to make him a drop back passer and we're going to show the world that he can do these things. It's always going to be disjointed and chaotic because he doesn't have a level of consistency in that part of his game to be able to sustain it over the course of a 17 weeks, 17 game season. I think about little kids. Think about if you give a little kid a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, and you say, you know, write your name and then they kind of write their name. And then you, then you go, OK, here's now we're going to graduate to line paper. Can you can you do that? And then can you keep it all in between the lines like. Russell Wilson's kind of lived with no lines on the paper, just kind of do whatever he kind of mm -hmm. wanted in terms of making things happen. And then now if you try and put him in something where it's like, okay, within the within the parameters of the play, within the parameters of the pocket, and with this timing in terms of parameters of time, I don't know that he, to your point, operates best under those parameters. And so the, the way you kind of solve all of this is that you get a little bit more out of your run game. You lean a little bit more on your run game. And I'll tell you what, your red zone percentage will go way the heck up if you can finish drives on the ground. Yeah, so let's think about this because people are thinking this is a knock. And it's not a knock on Russ. It's an understanding of his playing style. So yeah. in my mind, if you do what Kyle Shanahan has to do with Jimmy Garoppolo, if you do that with Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson flourishes, meaning, hey, I'm going to utilize the threat of the run, 
I'm going to give him a series of misdirection, deep shot plays, and stuff like that. So when he throws, he's going to throw for big yards because the running game is going to attract him. So I am saying, Nathaniel Hackett and the coaching staff, make the game easy on your quarterback. These kind of plays that we're seeing right now, man, live in that world. Live in the world of a bootleg, traditional, traditional play action passes, a bunch of different things with layered routes. Let Russell do that. It's not a knock on who he is as a player. At this point, if he wins at a high level, he'll get all the accolades and things that he wants. But what he doesn't need to do is feel like he has to show the world, I can play like Drew Brees. I can play like Tom Brady. I can cut people up from the pocket. You got to know your game. I think that's the biggest thing in life. Know who you are. Know your lane. And, man, just stick to that lane. I want I want to bring up a point and kind of – turn slightly here as we wrap this discussion up here buck um when you look at the comparison with tua when he was coming out right there were two comps mm -hmm. it was drew Brees, and mm -hmm. it was russell wilson and i remember we had these conversations as well and it was like look people are making this russell wilson comparison that ain't Tua. Nah, that's and you know how nah, many scrambles game. you know how many scrambles tua has this year one probably none oh one. Say probably none one because he's not that and then he's, he's not flourishing athletic. because we've talked about it it's not it's not about what you can or can't do it's about okay let, i'm going to design an offense that fits and now they have an offense where it is it is precision strike and that is who tua is man that is absolutely who he is so that that's like an example of of how you need to craft an offense for tua versus how you need to craft an offense for russell those are totally different styles totally different players now, and what that takes, DJ, it takes a few different things. It takes one, self-awareness, but then it also takes someone in the building to be a truth teller, to be able to say, here's where we are right now. We, we, we have three games under our belt. Let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the tape. The tape suggests that we as an offense are better when we run the ball and you do your thing off play action. So my job as the play caller, I'm going to put you in a position to succeed. Here's how we're going to play. When Nathaniel Hackett makes that move, then the Broncos were entered the conversation as one of the best teams in the AFC, particularly in the AFC West. When they make that decision that we're going to play, I would say, the right way, run it, defense, Russell, make a handful of plays, that's when they'll have a chance to go from good to great. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think you can make a case with Tua that, you know, games where he throws it, 30 plus times, I think they'll be okay because he's going to get the ball out. He's not going to take punishment. He's going to make good decisions. I think they can flourish that way. I think with Russell, what do you think the sweet spot for him is? You know, 20, 20, 28, 28, 28, 25, 28. Yeah. I think, I think, I think 28 to 32, but it has to be the right kind of passes. And yeah. DJ, it was the same way early in Seattle. I think life comes full circle. I think if you go back and look at how he played in Seattle very early in his career, I think you begin to do that. And I would tell Russ, we don't need you to put on the cape every week. There are three yeah. or four games where we need you to be super Russ and do your thing. But for the most part, if we can efficiently run an offense without you having to expend all of the effort and energy, why wouldn't we do it? Like at this yeah. stage of your career, you want to do less of the work until you absolutely have to. Don't feel like you got to go put all of this on your back and prove to the football world that you're this superhero. You just don't need to do that. No, it's interesting. Uh, definitely interesting discussion there. want to remind everybody about the London game. We've got Vikings Saints live on NFL Network from Tottenham Hotspur Stadium Sunday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Again, 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Don't forget about that. You're going to wake up and there's going to be football on, and it's, uh, it's pretty glorious. Also, NFL Plus is the league's new exclusive video streaming subscription service. NFL Plus has your game day covered with live local and primetime regular season and postseason games right on your phone or tablet. NFL Plus is available on the NFL app and at NFL.com. Subscription plans start at just $4.99 a month. Fans can visit plus.nfl.com and sign up for a free trial of NFL Plus today. Uh, in terms of Move the Six content, you can find it anywhere. NFL's YouTube channel, NFL.com. Uh, and the NFL app, you can find it there. So a uh, big weekend of football. What do we, uh, where we got again, Buck, Jags? We have a big one this week. You got the Eagles, right? This is the Doug Peterson Bowl. This is it. This is the Doug Peterson Bowl. This is one where you almost get nervous when people start talking about the team and the team having success or whatever. This would be a great uh, opportunity. I can't wait to see Jalen Hurts up close because DJ, yep. I, we talk about him. We talk about how he's evolved. 
he's exceeded everybody's expectations based on how he was drafted, what he was expected to be, and what he's become. Credit to him, but I can't wait to see it up close and personal. I am no doubt. Uh, have fun with that one. I'm going to be in Houston uh, for the Chargers and the Texans. Got to get a dub for their first win. The Chargers desperate need, for their you, second win. Got to get a dub. I need y'all to get that dub. I need that dub. I know. I know. We've got homecoming uh, Friday night for the Christian High Patriots against Patrick Henry High School. Uh, uh, that is uh, Ricky Williams' old high school. I want to say Eddie Vetter went there as well uh, from Pearl Jam. Oh. Who do you guys have? Uh, we're playing Chatsworth. Chatsworth is a local team down the street, so we get a chance to see if we can get on track after taking a loss, see if we can get back on track, see if we can get the 4-1. All right, there we go. 4 ones a heck of a start, Buck. Good luck with that one. Uh, that's fantastic. I appreciate you guys hanging with us. We'll catch you next time right here on Move the Sticks, presented by Griffles Plasma Donation Centers.